Estamos en la cuenca de Pisco, en Perú, un lugar inhóspito donde llueve cada 30 años. Aquí los vientos son constantes e intensos, la vegetación es inexistente y el clima extremadamente seco. Estas condiciones alejaron durante miles de años a personas y animales, pero en un escenario que parece desolador, se esconde un tesoro para la paleontología. Fósiles de ballenas en pleno desierto. Decenas, cientos de ellos intrigan a los científicos y los atraen hasta aquí. es increíblemente más intrigante de lo que nos imaginábamos como equipo. Bajo el caliente sol del verano peruano en la arena, yace un misterio. Lo más curioso no es solo el hecho de encontrar ballenas fósiles en medio del desierto. En un área que hoy se encuentra a cerca de 30 kilómetros del mar y que se cree que aquella antigua bahía fue una vez cubierta por el océano, lo que parece perturbador es la cantidad espantosa de ballenas sepultadas junto a delfines o incluso pingüinos sobre el manto de arena. El doctor Raúl Esperante trabaja investigando los fósiles de ballenas aquí en el desierto peruano hace más de 15 años, junto a un equipo multidisciplinario de investigadores de Estados Unidos, Perú, España e Italia. As I began studying these fossil whales, One of the main questions was, why are there so many? Why are they so well preserved? And why are they fossilized in the first place? Paleontologists and geologists use what's called the uniformitarian approach, which is we study modern environments and settings and processes in order to explain what happened in the past. Well, I did the same. En la búsqueda por desvendar lo que ocurrió aquí, Esperante comenzó con la premisa común entre los científicos evolucionistas. El presente es la llave para el pasado. En la práctica, en este caso, significó estudiar lo que ocurre con las ballenas muertas en el océano actualmente para poder entender lo que podría haber ocurrido con estas ballenas fosilizadas. Con este fin, el paleontólogo español realizó una verdadera travesía, no solo en la arena del desierto, sino también en las aguas del mar. I went on several cruises out into the ocean to search for dead whales in, on the sea bottom. And we found several, and uh, we monitored them for several months, and, or several years. And we took lots of images, pictures, And then we, we, we saw how the decay process happens. And it happens very fast. So fast that in a matter of a few months to a few years, there's nothing left. What commonly happens is that the whale dies and may float for a few days or even a few weeks. And decay begins in the body. If the whale sinks, It becomes food for many other organisms that live in the ocean, like fish, sharks, crabs, mollusks, um, a host of different animals that see that big whale carcass as a banquet. So they began to eat out the soft tissue, the flesh. Whales have a lot of fat, which is a good source of, um, of nutrients for marine organisms. That may take a few weeks or even a few months, but eventually all the flesh is gone, eaten up by scavengers. The interesting thing is that even before all the flesh is gone, bones are also scavenged 
especially by uh, crabs and worms, a special kind of uh, worms called oxidax worms that colonize the bones, bore into them, and in symbiosis with, um, with bacteria, they eat out the bones. So they perforate them, and in a matter of a few weeks to a few months, they destroy the bones completely. Pues el proceso monitoreado actualmente es un gran contraste con el estado de los fósiles de pisco que no presentan ninguna señal siquiera del inicio de la descomposición en los huesos. En este caso, la premisa uniformista no explica el pasado, pues el proceso actual no se compara al de otrora. Para que todos estos fósiles estén aquí hoy, algo muy diferente debe haber ocurrido. In order to a fossil to form, the organism must have hard parts, bones. A whale has bones. Rapid burial must occur. Otherwise, scavenging and physical and chemical breakdown will destroy the bones. And then the sediment in which the bones are buried must have the right geochemical conditions. So in this, in this setting, we have the bones. But if rapid burial does not happen, the bones are not going to be preserved and fossilized. And that's what happens in modern environments. Dead whales decay fast and are not buried in sediment fast enough to prevent scavenging and decay and breakdown. So all the bones eventually are destroyed in modern times. There's the likelihood of fossilization in modern environments is almost zero. So that raises the question, why do we have fossils in the first place? So we, if we go back to the conditions of the requirements of fossilizations, we do have bones and those bones must have, have been rapidly buried in order to fossilize. Otherwise, they, they would have been destroyed under conditions of slow deposition of sand and mud, just as we see in modern environments. Y frente a cientos de ballenas fossilizadas, la pregunta crucial es, ¿cómo murieron y qué exactamente causó la fossilización? Para conseguir reconstruir la historia, Esperante y su equipo han desenterrado fósiles durante todos estos años, analizando huesos, rocas y sedimentos. So we work different hypotheses. Uh, one of them is that they were killed by toxic algal blooms. That's a possibility. Um, we have not seen that in, in the present, but it's a possibility that we are considering. Why? Because the sediments have a high content of diatoms, which are marine algae. Some diatoms are toxic in modern uh, times, are toxic and kill marine and even land organisms. So we want to analyze the sediments, the, con the diatom content in the sediments and see if we can find a toxic species that may have directly or indirectly contributed to massive die-offs of, um, of whales. Otra hipótesis es la muerte de las ballenas como consecuencia de nubes de ceniza volcánica que habrían sido inhaladas por estos grandes mamíferos. How could that happen? Well, we know that whales need to come up to the surface to breathe. And if they inhale volcanic ash, their lungs may have been destroyed because when we, when we look at the sediment under the microscope, we see volcanic glass like shards with very sharp edges that would destroy the lungs. But again, these are hypotheses. We, I don't think we can prove uh, any of them, but they are working hypotheses that we are considering in order to explain the massive amount of dead whales that happened here. Otro detalle sorprendente que los especialistas descubrieron durante la investigación de las ballenas de pisco es una evidencia innegable el grado de preservación de los fósiles 
se presenta uniforme entre todas las muestras encontradas, lo que refuerza la hipótesis de la muerte masiva en un único evento. We have excavated tens of specimens of fossil whales. Some of them are fully articulated, mean, meaning that the, the skeleton is, the bones are connected as they were in, in life. Others show different degrees of articulation or disarticulation. The bones are disconnected from one another, but they're still associated, they're grouped, so that you can, you can say that it's a specimen. But all the specimens, all the skeletons, show a high degree of preservation, the same high degree of preservation regardless articulation. This articulation requires some time uh, during decay of, of, this, of the carcass. So you would expect to see here different degrees of preservation because you have the, the time to allow for this articulation. However, we find that the degree of preservation is uniform among other, uh, all, all these uh, specimens uh, found here. Again, that's not what you see in modern environments when you find several whale skeletons resting on the seafloor in the process of decay, you see different degrees of preservation. Some of them are heavily deteriorated and perforated by worms and uh, the bones destroyed, and others they're still in good shape because they had landed on the seafloor uh, recently. Well, we don't see that here. All the specimens are very, very well preserved. The bones are just like they were in, in, in life. And I believe that the, the possible explanation is that uh, they were rapidly deposited, all of them at once. But still, the question remains, why then do we find both articulated and disarticulated specimens. And again, further work is needed to explain those things. Como testimonios silenciosos, los fósiles en Pisco parecen colocar en jaque la premisa uniformista de que el pasado aconteció como el presente. Estos huesos no presentan un único agujero, como si realmente los parásitos no hubieran tenido tiempo para eso. Dado el tamaño de las ballenas y su gran número, algo descomunal parece haber ocurrido en un pasado remoto. Why are there so many fossil whales here? What we think is that we we are looking at conditions in the past that were very different from what we see in the present. Conditions of um, different, maybe higher, much higher rates of ac accumulation of sediment in the ocean basin that prevented decay and the scavenging and destruction and preserved the, foss the bones and fossilized them. So one main question is what caused the death of so, of so many whales? But Another important question is what caused fossilization? In order to have fossilization, as we said, you need rapid burial. Otherwise, bone would have been destroyed, as we see in modern environments. So we also have different hypotheses to explain that. And that's why we, do, we excavate fossils and we analyze the the bones and the, the rocks and the sediment and so on, trying to explain what caused the, the fossilization of them. We think that they must have been rapidly buried in, in this uh, mud and sand um, that then cemented and, and, and preserved the bone. But we don't know the mechanism of rapid burial. 
that is still something that uh, needs to be needs further study. Justamente por eso, una de las muestras más valiosas encontradas por Esperante y el equipo en Pisco es una ballena fosilizada prácticamente completa, incluso con nadaderas, que por asemejarse a una sonrisa, le rindió al espécimen el cariñoso apodo de la sonriente. Es interesante también considerar que el sedimento en el cual el fósil fue preservado fue depositado en el fondo del mar al cubrir los huesos. This is one of the most remarkable specimens of fossil whales we have found in this area. It is almost complete, almost a complete skeleton. This is the skull with the nasal bone here on top and the right side lower mandible here at the bottom. Here is the occipital area of the skull and the neck. The cervical vertebrae are down here displaced from the connecting point with the skull. And the rest of the vertebral column and, and ribs, part of the lumbar and tail uh, vertebrae are missing. Still, most of the skeleton is preserved, articulated, meaning the bones are connected to one another. And, uh, We can see that the bones are encased in a hard orange rock, but it's almost fully exposed. Um, the, the sediment, the rocks uh, around, has been eroded by the water, wind, etc. And it's now fully exposed. This sediment, this silt, fine silt, It accumulates also on the seafloor in present time at very low rates, approximately a few centimeters per thousand years. The likelihood of being buried and preserved and become a fossil is almost zero in modern environments. Why? This skeleton has an approximate thickness of 60 centimeters at a rate of a few centimeters per thousand years, this skeleton would take a few hundred years to accumulate, or even more, depending on the rate. In some modern environments, silt accumulates at a rate of 10, 15, 20 centimeters per thousand years. That means that this fossil, this whale, this skeleton would have taken 3,000 years to cover. But modern observations show that in modern times that the skeleton degrades and is destroyed very quickly in three, four, five years. So this should not be here, should never fossilized, have never fossilized if the environment, the environment in the past in which this whale was um, buried was similar to environments in the present. That's why we suggest that the environment in the past in which this whale was buried was different from what we see in the present. We don't know what it was like, but burial by sediment must have been very rapid, much more rapid than it, it occurs in modern environments. Aún así, el esfuerzo de toda la investigación en campo ha sido recompensado con uno de los más relevantes descubrimientos en este desierto peruano, una evidencia que puede ser una pieza clave en este complejo rompecabezas. There is even one more remarkable feature of this whale, which is the occurrence of, the occurrence of this structure here. This is what is called baleen. Baleen is the fil filtering organ of these whales. These are filtering whales. They are called misty city whales. They open their mouth and uh, they swallow large amounts of water and then they expel it out and filter it through this organ in the mouth and retain, the, retain small fish and, cre and krill. That's their food. This filtering organ is made of keratin. 
It's not made of two material or bone, bony material. And it's only the touch on the upper um, maxillary, um, or the touch on the gum. So when the whale dies, it detaches very quickly in a span, a span of time of a few hours to a few days. So if this whale was exposed on the seafloor for several years or tens of years waiting to be buried by slow uh, sediment, sedimentation, baling would have been destroyed very quickly, detached, removed, destroyed in a matter of a few days or a few weeks. The fact that it's preserved, and it is preserved in an atomical position, is a strong indication of rapid burial of the entire skeleton in no, no more than maybe a few days or a few weeks at the most. Un clásico ejemplo de este grupo son las gigantescas ballenas azules que para nutrirse tragan enormes cantidades de agua que filtran reteniendo el krill junto a pequeños peces y entonces expelen el resto de agua para fuera de su cuerpo. Las baleen son las mayores en tamaño que tenemos hoy en día y curiosamente constituyen la mayoría de las especies encontradas en el desierto de Pisco. Un detalle importante es que este órgano, compuesto de placas de queratina, el mismo componente de nuestras uñas y cabello, pierde la adherencia a la mandíbula luego después de la muerte de la ballena. Para espanto de la comunidad científica, entre los fósiles aquí en el desierto encontramos una centena de huesos completos que incluyen nadaderas muy bien preservadas y aún en la This misma posición de vida. Is not rooted in the maxillary as um, teeth are. It's only glued on the gum of uh, the, the whale by means of a, an organic a glue, natural organic glue that keeps the, the, the baleen attached on the gum. When the whale dies in the ocean, that organic glue that keeps it attached decays and the entire structure, the baleen, detaches from the mouth and is lost. Usually currents take it away and is, is uh, torn apart and, and breaks up and, and, and is destroyed. We've seen that uh, that happens in a span of time between a few hours to a few days. So that's why we usually don't see any baleen at all in dead whales on the sea bottom. And when we do find it, it's so badly deteriorated that the likelihood of preservation is minimal. And that is the reason why we don't see fossilized, we have not seen fossilized baleen until now. When I began these studies, um, I searched for um, cases, specimens of fossilized baleen in, around the world. I visited over a hundred museums and I found a handful of um, specimens of fossilized baleen, some in California and some in other places. And I examined each of them. Well, it was just a few examples and the reason is Baling does not fossilize. The likelihood of fossilization under modern conditions, for example, is almost zero because it's soft tissue that detaches from the organism very quickly and decays fast. Well, interestingly, here in, in this desert, we have found over 80 specimens with fossilized baling. And that's another um, piece of information. A strong evidence that supports the model of rapid deposition of these layers. 
Otherwise, baleen would not be found in any specimen if rapid deposition did not happen. Un importante motivo por el cual la investigación en Pisco es tan relevante es justamente descubrimientos como la sonriente que cuestionan el actual método de datación de fósiles relacionados con la tasa de sedimentación. No solo baleen is preserved in many of these specimens, but is preserved often in live anatomical position. Definitely that's not what you would expect if a slow deposition, gradually slow deposition over tens or hundreds of years happen, as we see, for example, in modern environments. So I think that something was different. Something happened differently in the past that we still don't understand, we don't know. Parece razonable pensar que un gran esqueleto pudiese reposar en un piso oceánico o en aguas rasas durante milenios sin haber sido perturbado por agentes físicos y biológicos que deterioran los huesos. El rompecabezas comienza a tomar forma, por lo menos aquí, en esta arenosa región de Pisco. Algo muy diferente tuvo lugar en el pasado, como lo muestran los intrigantes fósiles de ballenas que apreciamos con nuestros propios ojos. Definitivamente, en este escenario del desierto peruano, las rocas parecen revelar mucho más sobre un evento en la historia asociado a una súbita catástrofe. Y es eso lo que torna a los fósiles tan fascinantes. Ellos están aquí, bellamente preservados, como memoriales alertando acerca de un pasado que no debe ser olvidado y mucho menos ignorado. Cuanto más evidencias como estas son reveladas en las arenas de Lica, más urgente es nuestra necesidad de cuestionar hasta qué punto lo comúnmente impuesto por humanos debe ser considerado infalible. ¿Es realmente el uniformismo la llave definitiva para descifrar nuestro origen? La pregunta, ¿qué fue lo que causó la muerte masiva de estas cientos de ballenas? Permanece sin respuesta para la comunidad científica.